This episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Archvillain Games. Archvillain Games is having a Kickstarter from October 1st through the 30th selling character sheet gauntlets, which are like binders for your character sheet. These things are amazing. I got to see them in action at D&D in a castle. Their detail is just incredible. They look like amazing tomes. They have them for fighter, rogue, wizard, and cleric, but really they can work for anything. They're beautiful, incredible. I give it a chef kiss. Amazing. Over $40,000 was spent on the design and prototyping. These are made with high durability ABS injection molded plastic. They're available painted or unpainted, and you can get paint as an add-on if you want to make it yourself. Each one holds up to five character sheets, and they have all of the important information on your sheet visible so you can see it even when this thing is closed. It is really incredible. It's compatible with a blank sheet or with the standard 5th edition character sheet. It's designed to lay flat on the table. It's got a sliding tray that holds your character sheet and snaps into place. It will make your character sheet the most beautiful thing at the table. Unless you're playing with me, of course. You can check these out over at archvillaingames.com or head on over to the Kickstarter. Time is running out to grab your Arch Villain Gauntlet today. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James Intricasso. Today on the show, I am talking with designers Craig Campbell and Humza Cosmi of the Hydra Collective about the amazing work they do with games in horror and how to run and write awesome horror adventures. Craig has a Kickstarter going on right now for a horror game called Die Laughing, so you are going to want to check this out. It is launches the Tuesday, which is the day after this podcast launches. So if you're listening to this on this day it has launched, you're going to have to wait 24 hours or so for the Kickstarter, but otherwise you're going to want to check it out. It's Die Laughing. It's an amazing game. I've played it twice. We talk about it a lot in the interview, which you're going to hear right now. All right, everybody. Now I am here with two of my favorite people. Let the folks at home know who you are and what you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games. Craig Campbell, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Craig Campbell. I'm uh, the guy at NerdBurgerGames.com. I did a whole bunch of freelancing, mostly for D&D, a few other companies. And then a few years ago, I started making some of my own games, um, like Murders and Acquisitions a couple of years ago, Capers, uh, the super-powered gangsters in uh, 1920s America. Um, during Prohibition came out, uh, just got published a couple weeks ago, and I am wasting no time in diving into another Kickstarter, this time um, for a horror comedy game called Die Laughing, um, which is kind of how this whole thing got started, where I talked to James and said, hey, we, we should really talk about horror games. So that's kind of, it's a horror game, but it's it's kind of funny, and uh, everybody plays a character in a uh, horror comedy movie, and everybody's going to die, so... You, you kind of buy into the idea that you might survive, but probably you're dying. And when your character is gone, you become a producer on the movie and continue to influence the story. So you're still involved, even, even after the, your character is dead. It's kind of a short play, GM-less. It plays in just a couple hours, depending on how many players you've got involved. And that's going to be on Kickstarter, uh, I guess, tomorrow, Tuesday, October 30th. If you're listening to this pod, uh, this podcast on the day that it premieres, if it's a little further down the road than it was in the past, and maybe uh, maybe the Kickstarter's still still going on, so you can check it out. <laughs> maybe. And if this is far in the future, perhaps the Kickstarter has uh, funded and you have your copy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it is a great game. We have played it together twice, Craig. I had a blast both times. And you can listen to it on DSPN Presents this week and next week as well. So check it out. It is a really, really fun game. I am already contributing to the Kickstarter. And uh, Humza, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role-playing games? I'm Hamza Kazmi. I'm a partner at the Hydra Cooperative, mainly OSR-focused publisher, but we are extending our many Hydra heads into all facets of RPGs. Our two uh, latest releases are actually uh, serendipitously both horror-focused. Luca Reyes has created Witchburner, which is a 
small, tightly focused game module about a group of player characters who've been brought to this tiny little town up in the mountains and told that there is some bad things going on. We think that there's a witch in the town and you must find them and burn them. And the other one is What Ho Frog Demons, the fourth in our Hill Cantons line of products. And it's got one section, Beats for the Beat God, which is a comedy horror excursion where the player characters are engaging with a town that's been overrun by zombie beat pod people, if you will. (laughs) So I am super excited to talk to both of you because not only are these products fun, they're weird, they're twisted, they're dark, which brings me to my first question. What is fun? about horror games and what is fun about horror comedy you know i think on its surface it's like oh you're you're running around there's a high chance of death and and mayhem and grossness like that seems like maybe it wouldn't be fun but we love these things especially as gamers we love horror movies we love playing up the horror halloween i feel like halloween is the gamer's christmas you know my feed is like blowing up with stuff right now so what is it about horror that that we like and and how do we harness that craig let's start with you well i'm a horror movie and horror fiction um buff from way 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 back um and i've actually uh, like deconstructed all of this stuff many times in my head what you get out of movies or or comics or books or whatever short stories is kind of the same thing that you can get out of the rpg which is horror is whether it's gross you know horrific disturbing horror or if it's uh, more thriller oriented kind of scare terror horror um, or whether it's just mood and you know the feel and atmosphere of, of something that's a little unsettling and, and, and weird and odd. It gives us permission to feel those things without the repercussions of you could die or get hurt for real. So it, you do it in a safe environment. You sit down and you watch a horror movie and you can sit on the edge of your seat and your heart can pound a little bit and you can kind of you can have a jump scare and you can get repulsed or kind of go or get kind of disturbed by something that's a little a, a little out there. But then when you're done, you know, you finish your popcorn and you throw the uh, the half drank soda in the in the thing and you go home or you grab dinner or whatever. Um, and horror RPGs kind of give you the same thing. They give you permission to be scared, to be tense, to, you know, to be on the edge of your seat, to be kind of really jacked up um, emotionally, um, kind of deep down inside. Or if, if it's, you know, something that's kind of really disturbing and gross, you can kind of, you know, experience all of that as well. And then when you're done, you know, you and your buddies, you know, go to drink or um, or you move on to the next game if you're at a convention or something like that. So it, it's, it gives you a little capsule of, uh, of doing that sort of thing without the repercussions of like, if you were in a really horrific, <laughs> honest to goodness situation in your life, that would suck. <laughs> so you get that, you get that, you know, you get a taste of it. That's, that's the, the thing that I enjoy about watching horror movies and reading um, and playing horror games is that I get to have that, have that moment. Yeah, definitely. I remember being in middle school and like lamenting with my friends like, oh, it's so sad that there's not really a zombie apocalypse. And, you know, now as an adult, I realize like that's crazy as an insane life would be miserable if that was actually the case. But that's how much we loved that fiction. Right. Humza, what about you? What do you think makes horror games appealing and horror overall something that we love to consume? So I'm actually coming to this from kind of an interesting perspective. Like growing up as a kid, I horror just had no appeal for me. You know, I just stayed away from it. That sounds like a bad scene. Why would I want to watch that or read that? And so as I've realized, oh, I actually kind of like this stuff. I've also kind of tried to assess why am I liking this stuff? I'm approaching it, you know, kind of with somewhat new eyes. And one thing I'm going to add to Craig's statement is that along with having the adrenaline spike and the permission to feel those feelings that uh, that come in, horror games have an interesting twist that uh, many other games don't in that I think they're kind of notable for a lack of agency that shows up with the uh, players and their characters where 
in other genres, there's often sort of the power of fantasy. Like your characters are capable, you're uh, you know super tough or uh, intelligent, or you you have ways of controlling the situation around you. And a horror scenario, whether it's jump scares or it's something more brooding, is all about a circumstance where you don't have that control, where you are trying desperately to find some way to reassert it, but the status quo is that it's not uh, it's not available to you. I think that that's something that breaks horror games in particular from their compatriots in other genres. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very true, right? A lot of times in a horror mo- uh, game, you're not playing a person with superpowers or, you know, uh, any real great ability to necessarily defend themselves in some kind of way. And even when you are, here's the thing, like it, uh, you think about I don't know, Call of Cthulhu or uh, actually in horror films, uh, look at something like Aliens. You have people with shotguns and machine guns and flamethrowers and APCs, and it doesn't do any good. You have tools, and those tools are powerful, but they're not the tools that you need. You still don't have that agency. Yeah, that's very true, right? Predator comes to mind. You know, all of these amazing super soldier politicians uh, in the jungle, (laughs) Uh, and, and they can't take this thing down. So yeah, I think that's... That's a totally true thing about the power you have. And it's interesting because I think in RPGs, you see sometimes people who don't necessarily like consuming the genre in other mediums. Like they they can't watch a movie because it makes them too tense or they can't uh, read a book or, or whatever it is. They can play out the horror in an RPG for you know, because they're they're engaging with it in a different way, which is so interesting to me because it puts you right in that story. <laughs> it does, but it also gives you the uh, the flexibility to finally be the person who says, for the love of God, don't go in the basement alone. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I, was going to, I was about to say that it's like you talk about, uh, Hamza, about like not having the control that you do in like a fantasy game or a science fiction game where you're where you've got a lot more agency um, over your character but in a like if you're watching a horror movie you've got zero control over absolutely anything so you're really just along for the ride whereas actually in an rpg you may not be into the movie thing because like you said like you know you know people some some people look at horror movies and say well why would these people do these stupid things to put themselves in danger whereas i can play an rpg where i can make sure that my character doesn't go in the basement doesn't split up the group doesn't uh you know stick his face in front of the alien egg looking thing um, it won't do any good, but you can avoid right. doing those things. You can avoid you can avoid doing A, B, and C, and then you know D's going to get you. Right. <laughs> which which sort of brings me to the next question, which is how do we set up good horror scenarios? How do we you know write good horror scenarios, run good horror scenarios? What is key to making something truly good and horrific? Humza, you know, in in your example, right? You're you're talking about supplements that are made for game systems that maybe are not necessarily always horror focused, right? So how do we make things that are good horror scenarios? Well, one thing I would note is that depending on how you play it, low level D&D can absolutely fit into this zone, especially as the OSR style dungeon crawls where there are even or not not just dungeon crawls but there are even fewer ways for pcs to have a sort of safety buffer and uh often that you know that scene is oh i i don't know about that i want to have more control over my character and want to have a chance to stick with them but that very fragility can also help evoke those themes In terms of what you want to do to construct a good scenario, uh, you have to ride an interesting edge because you want to, um, like I said, I think part of it is making sure that the the tools that the the players start out with are not the tools that can resolve the situation. But you also want to make sure that it's still a situation that they can engage with in a meaningful way and that they still have agency as players to make decisions. Because if you go too far into the side of, no, you know, you have no way out of this, then it's just, all right, well, 
tell your story, Mr. GM. I'm just going to sit back and let you do all this because there's no way I can affect the scenario. So you want to have the sort of edge where they're out of their element in some way. There's something that they need to grapple with where the status quo is not sustainable and things are going to be getting worse. So there's uh, there's a external pressure that's acting on them in some way. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. When you think about any horror movie, that is that is the thing. There's something beyond at least the initial control of the main characters, be that a, a masked killer or, you know, some sort of, you know, thriller conglomerate corporation conglomerate or, or something like that, or Bradley Whitford uh, as a brain surgeon. There's something going on that is beyond the control of the characters and and you're watching it unfold and and seeing how much more out of hand it can get, which is really interesting, and how the characters are going to be able to surmount that. Uh, Craig, you wrote an entire game that revolves around telling horror stories. That terrifies me. Uh, no, pu- no, no pun intended. Uh, that terrifies me because it feels like so much relies on how do we get horror right in this game as opposed to like, how do we kill some dragons well, you know? Well, with with Die Laughing, it's, you know, it's a horror comedy game, so it, it follows slightly different rules um, because it is more lighthearted. I think we'll probably hit on horror comedy at some point here, but, like, as far as straight horror kind of stuff goes, I think, you know, from from a from the perspective of outside of the actual game play or the, you know, the actual scenario that's being put together, one of the things that I have found most useful is avoiding distractions at the table which is something that, you know, GMs and players always kind of grapple with anyway. If it's bright out and there's traffic driving by and um, everybody can just flip on, you know, fiddle around on their phone when it's not their turn and people are cracking Monty Python jokes, it's going to be a little hard to run Call of Cthulhu because Call of Cthulhu requires a kind of a, a, a mental state that you're in. You've got to be thinking about how your character is in way over their head. It's like, you know... That, you know, I think a lot of people will agree, like, you know, the moment you start having to fight the great old one, you have gone way off the rails in Call of Cthulhu. Like, there's there's no good outcome. You know, if you can defeat the cultists and get out with your insanity intact, with your sanity intact, you're, that's that's a win. No, no, insanity intact was the correct phrasing. I, I apologize. <laughs> you, are, you are correct. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I've, I've found, too, with when it comes to, like, if you want to get kind of good horror at the table is ideal – if you've got a group that you know you know them is know what freaks them out if you know your players well enough you can play it small and personal and not personal to the point of like hitting on anything that's gonna you know really harm somebody if like you know if somebody who has been through um an assault a personal assault or something you maybe be, be careful about you know replicating something like that but you know th- those types of things but if you know that like you know you've got a player that's a little bit wigged out by spiders and you got somebody that's uh is a little jumpy and you know uh, can take you know like a jump scare is going to really get them um and they're not going to get angry at you for it <laughs> you can you can have horrific little little things in the game you can build a, a scenario that is relatively small scale and personal and it's kind of like you were talking about aliens where i look at the difference between the difference between alien and aliens Aliens is big and impersonal, and it's an action movie. It's a horror movie, but it's an action movie. Alien, the original, is small and personal. It's about very specific personal character struggles about who's in charge of this and that and whether somebody can be led into the ship and what that, how that endangers the crew and whose responsibility it is. And it's and it's it's you know it's a much smaller thing. It's much, it's it's slower uh, pace. There's one creature you don't see it for a while, which is also very useful. You know, whatever the threat is, don't uh, necessarily feature it Im- immediately. That's, uh, I think, you know, one of the ways that you can make something um, really interesting for a horror scenario is is the scale of it. Keep it small and personal. Yeah, I think, and and you also touched on mystery, which I think is is a really good element of horror as well. If you don't know what is chasing you at first or what is going on even right there are some movies when i think about where it's like 
the moment you figure out kind of what's going on for me, get out right. When you figure out like, Oh, this is what's actually happening. This is why everything is so weird. This is why this is the way it is. It is mind blowing. Oh, it's time to go. (laughs) Where did I put my keys? (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's a big thing. And then the, you said another thing, That also uh, scares me to write, which is comedy. I think comedy can be very difficult to write. And often we see sometimes horror and comedy going hand in hand in movies like, you know, uh, Evil Dead 2, uh, for instance, right? Uh, they're, They're playing up the comedy there and it is without a doubt also a horror movie. How do we also nail the comedy because you are both talking about uh, comedy things that you have created as well. And Craig, uh, why don't we start with you for this one? Well, I think one of the things that come that you see comedy in horror is, it's certainly not always, but it, you know, very often I, I have found that like you, you've got a horror scenario or a movie, an RPG, whatever. And there's like the monster or the killer or the threat or whatever it is. And it's usually, you know, you can look at it usually some somewhat in terms of how ridiculous it is. And, you know, it's not real world. It's not, you know, you, most of the times it's not just like some person that has, you know, a, a grudge or, you know, a, a particular motive. It's, you know, it'll be a monster or it'll be some weird uh, uh, event that's taken place, uh, some entity that's rolled in. It'll be possession. It'll be, you know, murdering dismemberment goblins or whatever. Take whatever that ridiculous thing is and find something about it that you can make more ridiculous um, or something about the scenario or the, the threat itself that can be made more ridiculous. And that gives you the, the, the moment for comedy, like taking your example of evil dead Two, is that it's okay. We got a bunch of characters that are trapped at a, in a cabin and there's a demon thing in the woods that's running around on a steady cam. And it's, we've seen this before. It's called evil dead. But now in the, in, in this, in evil dead Two, we're going to, when a person, you know, when Ash gets possessed, now he's going to start cackling wildly and there's going to be all this zany physical stuff and there's going to be, you know, the stuff on the walls that's moving and it's going to be this extended sequence. And, you know, you can take, like, the idea of being possessed. Well, you're not just possessed, but you're possessed by something that's, like, making him do, like, a little song and dance number with this really contorted face. Um, you can do that in RPGs where you can take... If you've got NPCs that are getting killed, you know, well, what's happening to their bodies? Are there, you know, like one of the things that you see with horror stories all the, a lot of times is like whatever it is that's doing the killing will leave the bodies to be found in a certain way, right? They're, they're sending a message or whatever. Well, that message can be ridiculous. You know, the person can be, if it's a farming village, then the character, you know, the people that are get killed are put up on the scarecrow stalks and given a big, you know, goofy blood grin, you know, that's just painted with blood or something that, and it becomes like disturbingly funny and you can take scenes of brutality and gore and, and bloody, bloody this and that, and, you know, blow them over, you know, blow them up into ridiculous proportions and let that become funny. Um, where it, you know, if it's, if you're, if you're describing the viscera and you're using words like viscera, um, when you're doing it, giving it in kind of clinical terms, it becomes kind of disturbing. But if you talk about how like, you know, the guts are pulled out and they're strung up like, uh, you know, pipe or- like a pipe organ, you know, <laughs> in the description, you can you can put some funny into it and let it, it, it takes the edge off the horror, which I think sometimes helps people who like they want to do the horror thing, but they don't necessarily want to go too far down that road. So if they know there's going to be some comedy in the scenario, they're a little bit better with it. And it becomes a... Uh, a balancing points like you got something horrific and then you do something funny and then you do something horrifically funny and then you do something horrific and then you know so forth it's a counterpoint you know the comedy i find in, in in a well done horror comedy story the comedy is a counterpoint that actually kind of elevates the horror to a different level in the die laughing game that we played there is this great moment <laughs> where the killer is a masked killer and one of the rules built into the game that helps with the comedy is that the killer needs to kill with a different weapon, different ridiculous weapon every time they they attack in a scene. And so the players you could see were topping each other coming up with what was the most ridiculous thing that this guy could pull out of, you know, his Casey Jones golf club bag of weapons next. And so, yeah, I, I totally see that coming through in your design, which is amazing. 
Hey everybody, just wanted to let you know that this episode of Tabletop Babble is brought to you by Cobald Press. Cobald Press are the makers of fine 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons products like the Creature Codex, the Tome of Beasts, Deep Magic, and now the Warlock Patreon. Warlock is a Patreon-supported project from Cobald Press. With your support, the Kobolds make new 5e Midgard material on a regular or ongoing basis, which can be dropped into your Midgard campaign or really any dark fantasy 5th edition game. Who doesn't love that? If you become a patron, you'll gain access to new maps, new monsters, new 5e character options, and much more like the amazing Kobold Lairs, which are dungeons you can drop into anywhere. Subscribe today and you'll instantly get access to brand new mini dungeons and adventures like Smuggler's Run, Black Sarcophagus, The Fey Quartz, and more. Check it out at patreon.com slash cobalt press. That's patreon.com slash cobalt press for Warlock. All right, back to the show. Humza, you've got beats going crazy attacking people. How do you make comedy happen in horror? Going back to why I think it serves a useful purpose, it's really hard to maintain a single note uh, throughout an entire session. uh, And so if you have something that's trying to do just horror the entire time, like people are going to start to, um, you know, whether they want to or not, break the mood because that gets oppressive and it gets, you know, one note and unfun and you lose the you know, the creep factor that you do need for horror. And I mean, I think actually the example I always go to is the little comedy bits in Shakespeare's tragedies. Like you have, you know, Hamlet with all the blood strewn sea and, you know, the court of Denmark decapitated at the very end of it. But you also have bits with grave diggers and stupid puns and all these little bits here and there. Because it, it precisely because they help take the edge off, they let people laugh, and that means that they let down their guard, and that means that the times when the awful stuff shows up, it's that much worse. It's that much more affecting, because you start to laugh, you stopped worrying and feeling unsafe. Uh, read Macbeth sometime. That is a heavy, weighty play, and it has precisely one comedic scene when Macduff arrives arrives at the gatehouse dead in the middle of the play and so you've got this like you know hour of like oh my god things are so people are you know dead and there's there's um um, all these you know all this weighty subject matter um and betrayal and so forth and then we have like one little comic scene and it gets really weighty again that's the one with like the gatekeeper who's completely uh, drunk off his butt right yeah he's drunk the drunk gatekeeper when i think it's i think it's when Macduff arrives at the first arrives on the scene at the castle yeah it's a lot of wordplay. <laughs> so in terms of how I would integrate comedy into horror, it goes back to keeping momentum going. You have some funny moment, whether uh, planned or spontaneous, and you let that ride, but then you keep going and you have that the momentum of the situation continue to take place. And so that keeps up the pressure that the players are dealing with, keeps up the tension, but they've had that one moment that undercut it, let them get that out, and uh, actually lets them refocus on, oh God, everything is terrible. In terms of how you work it in, uh, so much of that depends on what tone that you want to go for in the, you know, in the game that you're playing. The, the humor that you're going to see in a slasher movie is very different than the humor you're going to see in the psychological drama or something like that. So figure out the sort of things that can work with the mood you're going for and use them to leaven the situation. And honestly, your players are going to have ridiculous, silly stuff come up because they're players. And I think that this is sort of inherent to uh, to role-playing games, that There is a certain amount of comedy that is almost always likely to just show up inherently because we're humans and we find things funny. So take that, and sometimes that may not exactly match what you're going for in tone, but that's where the momentum and pacing comes in. 
and you control how much that winds up diverting off of the tone and nature of the horror you want, or whether it's something you can work with, maybe you let the one you can work with ride a little bit longer, extend that out, and then use that to smoothly guide it back towards horror. Nice. Everything you all are saying, I agree with totally, totally, totally. Horror, I think, feels intimidating because we feel like we need to invoke a certain feeling. It's on us as writers. It's on us as game masters to invoke these feelings in our players. And if we fall short of the comedy or if we fall short of scaring our players we feel like we haven't been successful but i would also argue that it's also on players to come to the game with a willingness to uh to be scared with a willingness to buy into the scenario right there's there's a certain thing if you sit down to play mutants and masterminds there's a different buy-in for that than if you're going to play call of cthulhu Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I think that requirement of buy-in is something that you need for any game, no matter what you have going on. If you want to play uh, like Silver Age superheroes and one person is dead set on like late 90s uh, blood and guts superheroes, there's going to be a mismatch. There's going to be a mismatch because you haven't all agreed on what it is you're sitting down to play. Yeah, no, you're 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 totally right. And so how do we get that buy-in? Like what are what are some important ways because I think sometimes horror it seems like players can be more resistant to. They can be more like, "Well, you better scare me" because they have in their heads from playing other games, they're supposed to be heroes, they're supposed to be tough. They're not supposed to do the dumb thing and go down into the basement alone. You know, but that doesn't necessarily always make the best horror story so how do we get that buy-in from players that like hey you know be willing to be scared and i will do my best to scare you uh craig let's start with you on that one you have different gaming situations where if you've got like a home game i think you know you probably you know if you you, you know each other so hopefully you've built a certain level of trust and the gm um trust the players to kind of come along on the ride and the, and the players trust that the gm is not going to lead them astray and if you're going to, you know, if you're going to play a horror campaign or mini campaign or even a one shot, you know, it's it's worthwhile making sure that, you know, as, a, as the GM, maybe you bring it up and say, OK, here's what I'm thinking this is going to be. Are we all on board with this kind of thing? And then kind of, kind of the same goes for like if you're going to inject a horror scenario into a, a, an ongoing campaign that isn't necessarily horrific something that D people love to do is like when october hits it's like all right here we go time for the vampires you know just make it clear to like kind of out of game that you know, like okay normally you guys are big bad heroes running around and uh you kind of kick ass and you know we all have fun with that but we're going to go into october you know let's say and we're going to run like a, you know a, a double session of uh of this horror story it's going to be hopefully at times scary. It's going to be a little disturbing. Maybe it's going to be stuff that your characters aren't necessarily prepared to deal with. Going back to Hamza's comment about not having the tools to deal with the situation and just make sure the players understand that, okay, for these, for this session or two, I'm going to accept the fact that a fireball isn't going to do the job for me. <laughs> that it's, it's that the, 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 the go-to tactics aren't necessarily going to do what needs to be done. And there's going to need to be other avenues explored in order to uh resolve the storyline and uh you know and and i can expect that there's probably going to be the gm twisting things occasionally um doing some things that i'm not used to them doing in order to put me in the situation that i'm not going to be able to deal with something as easily what about you hamza how, how do you get that that buy-in from folks uh i imagine uh, as an OSR guy, like you said, first level D and D has a lot of horror qualities to it already. So your players probably show up ready to play. Yeah, like there's certainly amount of inherent uh, buy-in that we get based on system. Like, okay, there's certain baseline expectations of life is cheap, and I don't have the ability to tackle this thing head on. I'm going to have to think laterally because uh, going in head on is just like going against Michael Myers armed with, the, you know, trying to beat him up in a fight. It ain't going to work out well. For horror specifically, I think that, James, you're touching on a player's willingness or unwillingness to say, all right, I'm uh, I'm ready to be scared. 
And I think part of that is actually by showing a bit of vulnerability yourself as the GM, by finding something that you find horrifying or creepy or eldritch or whatever tone you want to go for and letting that bleed through. When you make it personal, when you show that this is something that would be freaking you out if the, uh, they, uh, if you were in their shoes, then I think that that comes through and that people start to become more willing to go along with that when they realize that this is something that you take seriously. Uh, if you approach it in a completely detached mode, it's I'm not going to say it's not possible. It definitely is. But it's, I think, a good bit harder for people to feel the hor- horror vibes that uh, one might be trying to give if you're not conveying the full tone of, yeah, this would this would disturb me. This would freak me out. Y'all are dealing with some really weird stuff here. I think that makes a ton of sense. And, you know, uh, I've talked to Rob Schwab before, and that sounds like it's sort of how he designs is he has these things he's terrified of that he can't get out of his head. And then he wrote Shadow of the Demon Lord. You know, it's... Uh... <laughs> and now he uh, other people can't get them out of their heads. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, to, to put it Batman's way, right? Like, Batman fears bats and wants his enemies to therefore fear bats. <laughs> uh, that's why I'm always putting spiders in things that I am making for my players because I'm like, I, I'm terrified of spiders. You should be too. And it feels personal for me and it it, you know that's probably why i'm doing it as like i'm like oh well this for sure is scary to me so it's probably scary to somebody else right even if the player is not at all terrified of spiders you know they they, you know deal with them all the time whether it's squishing him or taking him outside gently because you're scared of spiders you know that fear and that personal reaction the visceral that comes through, and that's something that I think people will latch on to. I think it is possible to get, like, for someone to have an extremely clinical, detached tone describing what's going on, and to use that as a different sort of horror, but that's one that I would want to, you know, sort of study and process very carefully, because it's not nearly as intuitive to me. So... Finally, uh, you know, we're we're sort of wrapping up here. Um, horror can get very intense. There can be things that uh, maybe freak people out that you weren't aware was going to freak them out, that they weren't even aware was going to uh, get some sort of bad reaction. The game isn't as fun anymore for them. And uh oh, now I've put someone in tears and I didn't mean to do that. Right. How do we set ourselves up for success with horror? We want everybody to be scared. We want everybody to come in and and being scared entails, you know, feeling a little bit edge of your seat, uncomfortable, that sort of thing. So presumably, if people are there to play a horror game, they're there to get that feeling. How do we stop from getting into like terrible territory, which can be hard when you're playing for an audience of six right it's easy it's almost easier to know where that line is when you have an audience of hundreds or thousands or millions of people if you're lucky enough to have an audience that big because you're like oh okay you know society has some very clearly delineated lines but when you have six people those lines could be much further in one direction or another uh so how how do we help define those boundaries when we are playing a horror game uh, what do you think, Hamza? Well, I think that uh, there have been a bunch of folks who've looked at you know RPG safety tools that uh, seem like they would come into play. I have not had occasion to use these in direct play myself because I am, I think, f- familiar enough with my players and my games d- generally don't hit like darker, more serious themes, but... If you know that the scenario that you've prepped is going to deal with areas which people are you know, far more likely to find personally relatable and traumatic, then number one, you let folks know up front, ch- hey, just checking in, you know, this next scenario might involve like threats to a child. And then people can make an informed decision of, okay, yeah, that's fine. Or, hey, I don't feel comfortable with that. There are uh, tools like stoplights and X cards and so forth for 
oh, whoa, this went someplace I wasn't expecting and I really don't feel comfortable. Here's a way I have at the table to sort of indicate that concern in a accepted way that doesn't require me to feel even more uncomfortable articulating why that's going on. You know, obviously the best thing is knowing your players well, knowing what uh, what works for them and what doesn't, but sometimes you don't have that luxury. Sometimes you're running a game at a convention or you're playing something for the first time, or even someone who you know well, maybe there's something that hasn't come up that's a really serious thing for them. Wow. Yeah, that is very true. Craig, what about you? What do you think as far as uh, you know, safety tools and uh, and keeping things fun at the table with horror? I think horror perhaps more than any other genre has the inherent risk without defining any specifics, just saying as a genre horror has more risk of running into something that is going to really get under somebody's skin and, 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 you know, get, get uh, to the point where they like, they, Oh man, I want out. I don't want to have, I don't want, we, I don't want to touch on that subject. I want to see if we can, we back this up. And I think the safety tools that uh, Hamza has talked about, um, there's, you know, there, there, there's, there's plenty of uh, different ideas out there for those tools. There's, you can find the ones that you think will be working, will, will work the best for the game that you're going to run. If you think you want to have something in there. And I think for a horror game, especially at a convention, it's probably a good idea when you're considering things to write for your horror scenario, <laughs> there's a website called does the dog die? <laughs> um, which that is, is great yeah. which is just a list of it basically lists movies where a lot of things that some people will have problems with happens you know is someone hit by a car um is electrotherapy used is a child abuse does the dog die are there snakes are there rats is there eye mutilation and i'm not saying that you need to you know go down and, and you know hit it like a checklist and you know decide what you want to include and what you don't want to include but like if you're dealing with players that you kind of know it's probably not a bad list to just kind of roll down that and think about your players as you're looking at it and say, Oh yeah, I know that so-and-so has, has, has expressed a, like they, Ooh, that's, that's, we're not going to touch on that with, with this person. Um, and I hate to say it, but there's like, you know, it's, it's a website that's helped that's intended to help you find, um, you know, to avoid those things in movies. If, uh, so you don't get hit with uh, the anxiety and, and the, the um, concern and, and, uh, you know, suddenly get triggered off on something that's kind of horrifying, you know, personally horrifying to you beyond just being um, a horror movie or an action movie or whatever. You know, one of, one of the people in my group, uh, you know, has had an accident once where they got, you know, poked with a needle very close to the eye and they are really like that is out. We are not going to do anything that gets poking at somebody's eyes. I'm not going to describe that at the table. Nothing like that. So you can just remove that. That is, uh, it's funny, I know of that website, but I had not thought about using it as sort of a resource to be like, oh, what weird things are there in the world that I don't know about that might, that's kind of a, a cool way to be like, oh, okay, maybe this is some territory that's more troublesome than I realized or that sort of thing, which doesn't mean you can't necessarily go there or or write there, but it is something that like, hey, maybe you want to bring up to your group uh, b beforehand if you're worried about it. Right. Using these uh, tools isn't a way to say, oh, you should never go near this or that, but you should think about how you're doing it and try and do it in a responsible and thoughtful manner. Because while you've got a game that you want to present to your players, you're also dealing with real people around a table and you want to make sure that they're okay. Totally, totally. And role playing games can be a great way to handle uh, certain issues or, or tackle certain wish issues if everybody's on board and you're handling it in a way that everybody is on board with. So, you know, this is not to say stay away from those things, don't do them at all. This is to say, keep the lines of communication open, be thoughtful, be present, and remember that it's all about having a good time. So yeah, this has been a great conversation with both of you. I super appreciate you joining me today on Tabletop Babble. Before we go, where can people find you, Craig? Oh boy, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Nerdburger Craig. You can find me at uh, nerdburgergames.com uh, to see all the stuff that I'm working on. Um, I'm pretty transparent with all that. You can go to drivethroughrpg.com to buy mergers and acquisitions and capers and eventually die laughing. 
um, which uh, up until uh, like from the day before Thanksgiving until the day before, sorry, from the day before Halloween until the day before Thanksgiving, you can check that out, uh, check out Die Laughing at Kickstarter. Um, and hopefully everything's going really well. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely check it out. It's a great game. And like I said, we played it over on DSPM Presents, so you're going to want to check it out when that drops as well. And Humza, where can people find you? Uh, I tweet uh, under at Alandaros, A-L-L-A-N-D-A-R-O-S. You can find the Hydra Cooperative on Twitter at, at, at Hydra Co-op, all one word. You can find us online at hydraco-op, and you can find our products on drive to rpg Well, thank you both so much for joining me today on Tabletop Babble. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. That was a great interview with Craig and Humza. You know, Tabletop Babble is still a new show, and you can help us grow on the internet by going onto iTunes and leaving us a review. It's really easy. It helps people find the show, even if they're not listening in iTunes. And if you leave us a five-star review, I will read it out loud and credit the person who left it, like Jester David from Canada, who left a review on October 9th, which is my birthday. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we got to get you back on the show, Jester David. Amazing game designer and all-around great person. Why? Because he's from Canada, and all people from Canada are, are pretty cool for the most part. I'm sure there's exceptions. Don't at me. So, but Jester David says, simply excellent, well-hosted, entertaining, and informative. This show features a wide variety of guests covering a myriad of topics. Whenever someone asks for recommended tabletop gaming podcasts, this one jumps right to the top of the list. Thank you so much, Jester David, for leaving us this five-star review. I am very touched, and let's get you back on. Come on, buddy. What do you want to talk about? You can at me on Twitter. All right, people, you can find me online and hit me up about game design at worldbuilderblog.com and on Twitter at James Intricasso. Also, did you know that I am hosting a new show? It's called Tabletop Voices. It's very similar to this one, Tabletop Babble, except that you can watch it live and I talk one-on-one -on -one with game designers about their life and times in the RPG industry. You're really going to love it. Check it out every Friday at 4 p.m. on the Encounter Roleplay Twitch channel, or you can catch up on YouTube, or guess what? There's a podcast feed over at don'tsplitthepodcastnetwork.com. It's also on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, all the places where you get podcasts. So go ahead and check out Tabletop Voices. Tabletop Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding it with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Don't forget that RPGs are like sex. There's no wrong way to roll it. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Cobalt Press. Cobalt Press, as you know, are the makers of many fine fifth edition products, some that have my name on them. They are one of my favorite third party design companies. I seriously can't say enough about them. Their products are play tested, they're well edited, they hire amazing designers, present company excluded, of course, and you can get so much awesome from them. I know I talked about Warlock in the middle of the show, but I just wanted to let you know I am a patron of Warlock and I have gotten more content out of this thing than I ever thought possible. For like three bucks a month, you get so, so much, so many amazing layers, so many amazing adventure ideas, articles that give you advice. There's new monsters. And if you're a player, there's player options too. It's really, really cool. I recommend you check it out. Go to patreon.com slash cobalt press. There's all kinds of great information there. And also the cobalt community itself is amazing. Search for Cobalt Press groups on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter. You will not regret it. Thank you so much to Cobalt Press for being a sponsor of Don't Split the Podcast Network.